I'm going to be in 2 Samuel this morning. 2 Samuel is where I'm going to be this morning for uh, the preaching time. Uh, while we were worshiping, I was thinking of an old, old chorus. I don't know if you know it, but it's one that I must have sung a million times uh, as we were as we were worshiping, it just kept running over and over in my mind. It says, uh, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your Spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. I don't know why that's on my heart and mind. I don't know that I've thought of that chorus in so long. But I feel like maybe today the Holy Spirit is looking for us to be willing to, with our whole heart, agree and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, yes, I will do what I can. I, I, will, I, I will respond to the moving and the leading of your Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and I will obey. Second Samuel chapter 23 this morning. Just one verse. I love the Old Testament. There are some of my contemporaries who say we need to unhitch from it and move beyond it and spend our time in the New Testament. But folks, these stories are not here by accident. They are there to build our faith. They are there to show us examples of how God used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And they are there to sh serve as examples of the spiritual truth that is contained in the New Testament, right? Now, you understand I hope you, I know you've been taught well enough to understand that there are some things that were religious or ceremonial in the Old Testament that we ha are not under those ritualistic ceremonial law like they used to be, you know. Don't plant two kinds of grain in the same field and don't wear clothing that's made of two kinds of fibers and, you know, we understand that that was ceremonial law that had to do with the Old Testament Judaism. And it's not in place anymore. In fact, there's one that says, men shall not uh, cut or shave the hair from over their temples, but shall let it grow long. Well, I don't see anybody here with those long tassels uh, coming down, guys, off the side of your head. So we understand that some of those things are not, uh, you know. Uh, there was an argument this week on one Assembly of God group that I'm a part of over whether or not preachers should always be in a suit and tie when they are preaching the Word of God, always. And, and you know, people arguing over stuff like that. Where does suit and tie come in the Bible? It's not there. If we want to be biblical, i got to wear sandals and a robe. You know, <laughs> that's how Jesus preached. So we get crooked on things that aren't meant to be crooked. But the reason I'm saying all that is this. The stuff that's not especially ceremonial that you know, well, that was part of the Old Testament, you know. You didn't bring turtle doves or pigeons with you to worship because we don't need to anymore. Jesus was our sacrifice, and that's settled, and that is over. But when we look at the historical books especially, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. When you read Genesis, when you read Exodus, when you read Leviticus, when you read those historical books, you can understand that there is a spiritual lesson, or many of them, to be gleaned from those Old Testament stories. There's a reason they were preserved in canon for us. So, Second Samuel 23, verse number 20 says, "Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel." who had done many acts, he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. Father, thank you for this scripture today. I pray that you would help me to be true, to be honest, and to exegete the Word, God, in a way to, to bring forth the true meaning of the Word and the spiritual application of it, to not stray to the left or to the right, but God, to give an honest answer to the people this morning from your word, in Jesus' name, 
Amen. This message this morning is one about one of King David's mighty heroes, Benaiah. He was one of David's mighty men. He was a mighty warrior for Israel. You can read on in the next verse uh, about even more mighty acts that he has that he did in his service for God, in his service for David as the king of Israel. I believe this morning I see in this passage a message for us today. I believe it is a call for us to be awake and to be alert and to be sober, to be vigilant uh, about the time that we're living and to be proactive instead of reactive. I believe it's so important that we live in such a way that we are proactive in our faith instead of only reactive. And you understand the difference, right? Proactive is taking the right steps uh, and not just responding. Reactive is the fire department. Fire department is reactive. Thank God for for those men and women who serve the uh, Department of Fire. Uh, But you know what? They're reactive. When the bell and the alarm goes off, they react to something that is that that is going uh, th- that is going on. You don't see them out there uh, all hooked up, you know, ready to prevent a fire. But they react. Too many Christians and too many churches have become just reactionary. When something happens, when something occurs, we react to what the devil is already doing. I believe that if you look in the New Testament at the spiritual armor that God has given to the church, God calls us to be proactive in our faith and not reactive only, to be fighting a holding uh, uh, action, to just preserve what God has already won. But Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Let's go. Let's march forward. Paul says you're running a race. Paul says you're fighting a war. Paul says you're walking a walk. Whatever imagery you want to use, I see all of that. You see, you know, soldiers and 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 athletes, they have to train, they have to be very proactive about things so that they can be ready in a moment when 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 the enemy attacks, they don't have time to go off and do all their training and learn how to use a sword and and get ready and and show up at the battlefield, you know, (laughs) six months too late. But they've got to be proactive in their training. Athletes have got to be proactive. You know, those that compete in the Olympics train for for four years to get ready for those moments. And they may compete in other meets to get ready, but their their eye isn't on winning those regional or those, th- those lower meets. They've got their eyes uh, on when the world gathers together in the Olympics of running that big race. Folks, our eyes are set on the prize of the mark that is set before us, which is one of these days crossing the tape, crossing the finish line, and hearing the Lord say, well done, uh, come on in. Uh, you've arrived at your final destination. So the picture today is this. You've got Benaiah who uh, I'm going to call him Ben today because it's so much easier than to try to keep pronouncing that big Hebrew name. We'll just call him Ben uh, today. He looks around his home and he sees tracks from a lion, right? That's what it says, that he saw a lion, that he he slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. Now, the part of the world in which Ben lived Having snow all around is a rare occurrence. Some of the high peaks, some of those high mountains would get snow, but it's a rare occurrence. So he has snow on the ground, and in the snow on the ground, Ben must have noticed that there was uh, tracks of a lion, and he's able to locate that thing and see that it has been around. He had to face the facts. The first is there's the opportunity. The snow revealed that there was a beast, an enemy, a danger that was lurking around. He had the opportunity. The second thing is he had to face the facts, the circumstances. There is a lion prowling around. I know lions exist, you know. I'm talking in, in the form of Ben now. He could say, I know that lions exist, but I've never seen one around here. They're, they're somewhere else. They're, they're out in the wilderness. They're far from here. They're, they're, they're in other places. But when the snow is on the ground and he sees the tracks, he has to know this isn't just somewhere else happening to somebody else at some other place, but I see evidence 
of a lion prowling right here, and he has to take action. He's got to make a decision. He's got to find that lion, and he's got to dispatch it. That or he's just got to hope, well, I'll just build a bigger fence, and I won't let the kids go out and play, and I'll try to keep the livestock close to the house, and I'll hire a good shepherd. Which way is he going to play this? Well, the scripture that we read is very evident that Benaiah decided to be proactive, and while he had the opportunity, you see, he could track that lion. When I was a kid, I didn't know anybody that had uh, hunting dogs that hunted rabbits. So when we got an occasion where we had an inch or two of snow where it was deep enough that you could go in the woods and track rabbits, I used to love to go out and try to track down a rabbit. Uh, you know, very few did I ever actually kill, but oh, it was so much fun traipsing around in our rare snow in Arkansas and seeing those rabbit tracks and finding out those little critters are pretty smart because they'll run a big loop and they'll backtrack on themselves and, and, and track them down. And finally, you find one in a log or under a log or something if you're fortunate, but you have to make that decision to track it down. Ben is not hunting for sport. He's not out hunting for something to eat but he sees in the snow the opportunity that he can uh, hunt down a lion that is a danger, a predator, a, a, a potential man killer, could take his sheep, could take his cattle, could take his children, could even take him if he wasn't careful. And so he decided to take action. He was proactive and not reactive. He didn't wait until the lion attacked him to kill it. He didn't wait until it was carrying off one of his sheep or one of his donkeys or, or whatever to, to track it down and kill it. He didn't wait until his child or a neighbor's child had been devoured to get a hunting party together and to go take care of this problem. But he took advantage of the situation to take action. So what's the purpose? That's the picture. You got a man who sees evidence of a killer beast and decides to take action and, and do away with it while he had the opportunity. What's the purpose? God is trying to give us an example, I believe, of how we should be in regard to our spiritual well-being. Huh, hunting a lion to my spiritual well-being. How do I make that connection, Pastor? How did you make that connection, Pastor? How, explain where you're going uh, with this story. Well, I believe today that you and I are being given opportunity. You see, on a rare occasion of a snow in the part of Palestine there where ben, where ben lived, he looked out and he didn't see rabbit tracks, but he saw lion tracks. So there's the opportunity to look for lion tracks and to see where the lion has been roaming around our stuff. We need to see the circumstances that we are in today. Oh, well, we're safe and we're well and we're all good right now, but what are the circumstances? Do you understand that there is a lion roaming around? Uh, Pastor, get where you're going, <laughs> all right? We're also aware from the Scripture that while everything is well right now, I've got money in the bank, I've got a car to drive, I've got a nice church where all the bills are paid, and at the end of the month, we've got money left over after we've paid the bills. I'm free, I can get in my car and go to the church that I want to, and I can worship, I can go to the grocery store, and there's food on the shelves, you know, things are pretty good. Things are really pretty good compared to the way most of the rest of the world lives. Things are pretty good. But do you also understand that there is a roaring lion that is roaming around looking for a chance to attack? Yeah. You see, we've got to be aware. And so we have the opportunity. I believe that God is saying to me to say to you this morning, a church, while everything is pretty good right now, there's no schism in the church. We're all unified, uh, you know, and, and we're, we're together. We're of one mind and we're of one spirit. 
While there's no big problem financially, there's no big issue that the church is dealing with. Uh, our people, uh, you know, are, are together. Uh, we, we don't have as the amount of people that we'd like to have, but there's not so few of us that we can't pay the bills and keep the church moving forward. We're, we're not in desperate situation. But we need to look around with the eyes of enlightened by the Holy Spirit and see the reality See the reality that at any moment, if the enemy should attack, if the enemy should come against us, that he could cause great harm, great damage, because he is there looking for that opportunity. So rather than wait until he attacks, why don't we go after him this morning? Why don't we be soldiers who are running the lion off, who are tracking him down in a pit on a snowy day? You see, I know that I'm reading extra into the Scripture, but I just imagine that because it was a snowy day, this lion gets caught in this pit, and due to the snow that is on the ground, the lion isn't able to get out to, on his own. So Ben can know, well, you know what? He's in there, but as soon as this dries up, as soon as this melts, he's not going to be in there forever. So I've got an opportunity right now to take advantage of getting rid of this problem. We've got to look around and decide on a course of action. We can wait on a more convenient time. I picture Ben again. You know, it's snowy and it snows so rarely and it'll be gone in a day or two. It's just really cold. It doesn't usually get this cold. And I'm going to stay in the house and keep the fire warm. And now I know there's a lion out there, so I can deal with him on a day when it's 70 degrees instead of 30 degrees. I, I can deal with him when I feel a little better. I don't have hunting gear for cold weather, and, and, and I just really don't want to get out there and, and, and you know, Oh, I know there's problems going on. I know there's issues going on, but I really don't want to deal with it right now. Let, let, let's, let's push it off. Right now, I've got these other things. Right now, everything's okay. Right now, my, my cart, it, it, my, my ox isn't in the ditch right now. Everything is going pretty well. Let's just push it off. Let's just wait a little while. But you see, a more convenient time may never come. A more convenient opportunity may never show up. Let, let me explain to you in this way. And I think I've said this before, but maybe you haven't heard me tell this personal story. One day in about March of my senior year of high school, so it would have been 1990, was gathered at my lunch table, and our cafeteria had big round tables, probably larger the way my memory serves than the ones that we have in our fellowship hall. And you kind of got into the habit of sitting at the same place around the same people every day. And so around our table that day, there were eight or ten of us that were gathered around the table having lunch together. Same guys I sat with all the time. Guys that I went on camping trips with and fishing trips with and parties and, and hung out with and went bowling and all the things that we used to do to have fun uh, in, in those days. And we were sitting there at the table that day. Uh, and so I had four periods before lunch and then three after lunch because we were second lunch. And so we got done with lunch. We went to fifth period. Fifth period for me was Miss Bobby Graves' uh, Senior year, so it would have been calculus class. We're sitting there in class, and all of a sudden, Miss Graves' class was on the new wing of the high school, so we had a view outside. Most of the old building didn't have outside windows where you could see outside. The new wing did. We could see outside, and on the parking lot, the uh, football parking lot, in came a couple of cop cars. Right behind them was an ambulance, and then all kinds of first responders started coming in. And no sooner had they started coming in and running into the building than the uh, principal, Miss Betty Cook, came on the intercom and said, Teachers, the bell is about to ring, but do not release your students. Keep everybody where they are. Hold them in your classroom until we give you further notice. What's going on? Well, to make a long story short, one of the guys that was sitting right there at my table, who I had had lunch with nearly every day for the whole of my senior year, who I joked with and laughed with and, and went to events with and was in the band with and in junior ROTC with, 
was sitting there at the table that day with a pistol in his duffel bag. In his fifth period class, there's a girl in there that he was infatuated with. He asked her one more time for a date. And instead of just answering him, she turned to her friend and they started laughing. We're kids, 17, 18 year old kids. He took the gun out of his bag, put it in his mouth, and killed himself. Right there in fifth period. Bam. Folks, there's a lot more to this story. I'll stop right there because that's sufficient for me to say what I'm trying to say to you. I had, I was the only one of my group of eight or nine at that table that was a committed Christian. I was in church all the time. I was spirit-filled. I already knew God was calling me into the ministry, although I didn't want to go. But we sat at that table and we talked about TV. We talked about sports. We talked about Whatever 17 and 18 year old kids talk about around the lunch table, which girls we thought were, you know, pretty, whatever. Whatever it was, it was all just nonsense. And for months and months, I had thought, no, I'm not going to witness. No, I'm not going to tell them about Christ. This isn't the time. This isn't the place. There'll be a better opportunity. There'll be a better place. I'll be humiliated. I'll be mocked. I'm the only Christian at my table. They'll all make fun of me. I might lose all my friends. I want to tell you in the span of 24 hours, three of those nine that were at that table died by their own hand. (coughs) Folks, the devil was roaming around seeking whom he might devour. There wasn't any kind of suicide pact like the national media had, 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 had portrayed out there. There was just a spirit. There was just an attack of the enemy. There was just an open door. Well, you know, that, that for people who were depressed, who were hopeless, who did not have Christ. And there I sat as the shining light, as the salt, who did not get out of the shaker, who did not open his mouth, who always said there's going to be another opportunity and until bam, Thomas and Tommy and and Charles are gone forever off the There's no more opportunity to share how much Jesus loves them. There's no more chance to invite them to Sunday school or to my church. There's not another opportunity to to ask them if I could share how much Jesus loves them. It's gone. It's suddenly over. It had been terminated in a moment without any further recourse. I'm trying to tell you that as we look around this world today and we see the evidence of of a lion roaming all around uh, in our families, in our lives it may that lion track may look like drug addiction that lion track may look like pornography it may look like spiritual wickedness in high places it may look like a world full of attraction that is drawing people's attention other places. It may look like a job. It may look like a, 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 a relationship with another human being. But we see the, the tracks of an enemy that is working against our church, against our family, against our our way of belief against us. He's roaming around, and if you'll just open your eyes, his tracks are all over for us to see that the enemy is not just hiding somewhere, hoping that Jesus won't come back and do what he said he's going to do in this book. But Jesus said, i got to get off the track of the notes and just preach this morning because I feel like I'm, I'm getting through I feel like I'm struggling today, so pray for me that I'll be able to complete this message this morning in a way that will bring glory to Christ. Let me just tell you, Jesus said in John 10 and 10 that we have an adversary who is looking to steal from you, to kill, and to destroy. Uh, uh, We're told in, in another scripture that he is as a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. Be vigilant, Peter says, be aware, be awake, church. The enemy is 
isn't just hiding somewhere knowing, well, Jesus defeated me at the cross. There's nothing else I can do. But he's roaring and he's searching as a lion looking for an open door, hoping that the church will just sit around and sing the songs of Zion and just ignore all the work that he's doing. Meanwhile, he's devouring families. He's devouring lives. He's destroying America. It makes me sick to see all of the wickedness that is on display in our country today and you can't say anything about it or you're a bigot or you're a hate monger or you're or you're somehow racist or homophobic or whatever other label they want to throw out there the enemy tracks are all around when we see churches that say I don't have any place for the cross in my sanctuary put it out or put it somewhere else. Don't sing the blood songs because they might offend somebody. Don't speak in tongues in the service because it might confuse somebody. Don't display the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the service because it might get out of order and it might confuse somebody who don't know what's going on. Oh, don't share your Jesus when you walk out. I see the tracks of a lion who's roaming around looking for an opportunity to devour. When I could take this internet attached tablet and with just a few quick strokes, I've never tried, but I know that it's possible to just in a few quick strokes of my fingers be able to pull up instead of the Word of God, pornographic imagery right there. That's the tracks of a devouring devil who's looking to destroy our hearts and minds. When I can easily be able to find, folks, damaging and destructive substances that are sold legally. Oh, they're taxed. And maybe you got to be 21 to buy them, but they're readily available just between here and my house how many stores that sell tobacco products and alcohol that destroy and damn and addict and waste away people's lives and if that's not enough electronic cigarettes uh, that uh, those e-cigs and vapes and things that destroy the body folks oh it's just harmless pastimes and people will do what they will do but I see the traps and the devices of a very intelligent very smart devil who is roaming all around looking for whom he may devour when he can get a church to say I don't need to read my Bible every day I can just put it aside I don't need to pray every day why my pastor is praying for me. I don't need to give of my finances to the church. The church is doing all right. Pastor just said we got more than enough money to pay the bills this month, so we're doing all right. I don't need to witness to anybody. I pay a pastor and I give money to missionaries. They'll take care of the witnessing. It's the devil. That's not the truth of God's word. That is a roaring lion who is looking to devour the church. And while he may know that he can't get you because your name's already written in the Lamb's book of life, if he can get you to shut your Bible... If he can get you to shut your mouth and quit praying, if he can get you to keep your mouth closed and not witness to your friends and neighbors, if he can get you to not volunteer around the church to help and to do things that need to be done because you're too busy and you don't have enough time, and if you did that, somebody might not like it and they might complain about it or complain about the job that you did. I'm telling you, look around and understand when you look around and you see people getting discouraged and you see see people wanting to just throw in the towel when you look around and see people saying, well, what's it worth? You know, you see pastors who are struggling and who are straining. I talk to a lot of pastors. People just haven't come back to church since this COVID thing. Folks that go to work and go to Walmart and go to vacations and go to every other place, but they're not, don't feel like they need to come back to church yet. 
Uh oh, Pastor. I see the tracks of a devil that is working against the one institution that has kept America free and powerful and under God's hand. Folks, the Republicans haven't done it. The Democrats haven't done it. The LGBTQT crowd hasn't done it. Uh, the, 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 the Lions Club or the, the JCs or the Kiwanis Club or whomever, they haven't kept America blessed, but it is the true Bible-believing church of the Lord Jesus Christ that has kept America out of God's judgment and in God's blessing for all these years. When you see God's people say, I don't see any need to stand up against abortion. That ought to be a woman's choice. I don't see any need to take a stand on drinking while the Bible just says don't be drunk doesn't say he can't drink. Well, you know, I don't see any need to be involved in politics because, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is not of this world, so <coughs> I'm not going to be involved. <coughs> Can I just say something to you? If the church disengages from politics, who does that leave to be involved in them? If righteous people say, I don't want anything to do with politics, it's corrupt and it's dirty, who does that leave to make the decisions to run our country? All the unchurched, ungodly people will be making all the decisions. I'm telling you, church, when we see bills that are coming up that they call equality, that, that clearly say you cannot stand by your Judeo-Christian values in your hiring and firing and staffing uh, decisions because we're going to tell you what you can do. The church needs to understand that that's not just a Democrat thing or a Republican thing. It's not even an equality thing. That is the very clear evidence that a roaring lion is looking for ways to destroy and to come against the church. You know, there are active, constantly, bills being filed in other states seeking to take away church's tax protection seeking to take away the ministry benefits uh, that, the, that the IRS has given forever to churches and to pastors and to clergy. Why? Because if we can't shut them down for their free speech, we'll come against their finances and we'll close them down by telling them, oh, you got a $2,000 offering today? Well, that's tax. You got to pay uh, federal and state taxes on that money. Most churches would absolutely fold because we're not getting rich in this thing. Oh, uh, y'all are all, maybe today's message is for Travis George, maybe so, <laughs> because I'm getting some really blank looks this morning. I apologize if this is not one of the best that I've ever brought to you this morning. I firmly believe that this is what God has asked me to preach today, and I'm sorry. No, seriously, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to self-abase. I just don't feel like I'm getting the message across this morning that I intended to get across. So I believe that this is our time not for defeat. I'm not here preaching a message to you this morning to make you think, oh God, we've lost it all. Look at what the enemy is doing. Folks, you try to watch television. I try. And the commercials, even when I'm watching a, a decent thing like just sports or, or a, a decent program, the commercials that they put on are full of garbage and filth. Portraying lifestyles that you and I find abhorrent and sinful as being the norm. And it's disgusting. What do we do about it? What, 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 do we do, what do we do about it? Well, folks, I believe that this is our time for victory. I've just simply come by this way this morning with a message from the Lord to wake up. Arise out of your slumber. This is not time for a church to sit on her pews and on her haunches and just say, oh, Lord, take me out before I fall away. Oh, Jesus, come back for the righteous before we all fall away. Oh, Lord, please come back while there's still a church. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we need to build a fence around the church property and everybody move on here and we're just going to have a cult, a, a commune, and hopefully we make it until Jesus comes back before the enemy takes over. Over. What I'm telling you is we have been given more authority than the devil. We've been given more power than the devil. He's active. He's roaring. He's searching. He's looking for ways in, and he's being quite successful. But church, Jesus is still the Savior. His blood is still powerful and effective. And if we will just be proactive instead of reactive, you see, Benaiah said, 
I'm going to deal with this problem right now. One way or the other, there, there's an old fellow that I used to listen to records of from years ago, and he talks about a friend, uh, a, a relative who was hunting, and he got up in a tree with a wild cat, and his hunting partner is down there, and this battle's going on in this tree, and he's hollering down for his buddy, oh, just shoot up in here amongst us. Just shoot up in here. He says, I can't shoot that cat. I might hit you. And he says, just shoot up in here amongst us. One of us has got to get some relief, he says. One of us, either me or the cat one, we can't keep going like we're going. Church, I'm trying to tell you something this morning. We cannot sit idly by and let the devil destroy America. You and I, children of the Most High God, have got to be proactive. And when we see the enemy at work, we can't wait around and say, well, at least that doesn't affect me. Well, at least that doesn't bother me. Well, at least that doesn't that doesn't affect the things that I like or the things that I do. It, it doesn't take any, you know, does, doesn't have direct impact on us. If we keep sitting on our hands and doing nothing, then what happens when they do take direct action against you or your family or your church or your way of belief? There may not be anybody left to help. It may be too far gone and too late. I'm telling you, now is the time for the church to be like Beniah. You see, I know that I'm using my sanctified imagination, but I just see him looking out. He gets up and he looks out on that fresh snow that's fallen, a rare occasion, and he sees lion tracks. Maybe they circled around the house. Maybe they were out by the barn. Maybe they were out where the children play when they go outside. And he sees those lion tracks. And I see in my mind that he goes into his closet and he gets his bow. And he checks the string. And he looks for his arrows. And he makes sure that they're sharp and straight. And the feathers are good and ready to fly. And maybe he finds his sword or his spear, whatever else he carries as his second weapon. And he makes sure that the edge is good and that it's ready to go. And that he's got a good grip and he's ready. And then he finds his boots for for going out in cold weather or whatever he wore I, I, and he finds uh, some nice warm clothes to put on and he gets himself ready. He stops by the kitchen and he eats himself some meat and some protein and he gets ready. He grabs himself a flask with some water, maybe puts a couple of dried pieces of meat and a biscuit in a pocket or in a bag somewhere and he gets ready to go out. And his wife says, Ben, there's snow out there. It's cold. Why don't you wait? What do you got to go do today? Surely you don't have to go into work today. And he says, hon, there's a problem and I've got to fix it right now. There's an issue, and I've got to do something about it right now. What's going on, Ben? And he says, I'm telling you, I'm not going to wait until that lion comes back in the middle of the night and destroys our livestock. And I'm not going to wait until one of the children loses its life because that lion come around here while the kids were playing. And I'm not going to wait until that lion catches you headed to the well to get some water and drags you away by your throat. I'm not going to wait until I'm weak and weary coming in at the end of the day all tired and the lion jumps on my back and, and, and destroys me but I'm going right now to see what I can do and with God's help I intend to put a stop to what's going on around here church I'm trying to tell you it's not time to look around and say, well, I'm just going to wait. Let the pastor do it. Let the leaders do it. Let somebody else do it. But right now, I'm telling you, just like Ben got his sword and got his spear and got his coat on and got ready, you need to get to the basics. You need to prepare yourself for hunting lions. You need to prepare yourself to hunt that lion. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I'm saying if you're not saved, it is time to fully and totally commit your heart to, to Jesus Christ. You don't have any protection from that lion unless you accept Jesus Christ into your heart and life. That's the only, li that's the only lion uh, uh, defense. Y'all remember the really campy... 1960s edition of Batman that used to be on TV with Adam West. Oh. When I was a kid, I thought that thing was great. You look back at it now and you're like, oh my Lord, how did I watch that? He had a utility belt, right? And no matter what happened, he always had something in that utility belt. Need shark repellent? I've got the bat shark repellent, Robin. 
Need lion repellent? I've got the bat lion repellent, Robin. It was always there in that belt. He always had it ready. You are not Bruce Wayne. You are not Batman. You do not have a belt that you can just put on and say, well, I don't have to worry because I've always got the repellent. I've always got what I need. You, child of God, have got to prepare yourself for the day of battle. You've got to get ready. You've got to be strong. You've got to be courageous. And what you have to do is, first of all, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, not mama's God, not grandma's God, but my Lord and my God in my heart because then, then you have the power and the ability to overcome every lie, every deception, every trap that that devil tries to bring your way. So once you've accepted Christ, you've got to get to the basics. If you served in the military, that recruiter promised you, I'm sure, that you could do this job or that job. But the first thing you did was the same for every soldier, every seaman, every Marine. You went to basic training. Every airman, basic training is the first thing. You load on a bus or load on a plane or whatever it was, and they shipped you, put you in a platoon with a bunch of other men, women that were just coming into the service. They shaved off your hair. They gave you clothes that looked like everybody else's. And they broke you down so they could build you up and teach you how to be in this man's army. (laughs) Told you how to be a servant of Uncle Sam. Folks, I'm here telling you that you can be a conqueror, you can be a champion, you can be an overcomer, but you've got to get to basic training. You have to get to basic training. You have to train yourself to be a lion hunter. You have to train yourself. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, when we are babes in Christ, God takes care of us through grace and mercy, but he doesn't expect us to stay babes and just depend on God's grace and mercy to take care of us for the rest of our lives. He intends for us to do everything that we can do to build upon our faith, to become lion hunters, to become defenders of the faith, to become soldiers in the army of God because there are other people depending on us to be active. So what do you got to do? Basic training in the military, they taught you everything, right? They act like you didn't know anything, and they taught you how to answer them, how to stand, how to sit, how to run, whatever, man, like everything. You come to the Word, you come into the army of God, your basic training, we call them spiritual disciplines. You've got to pray. You must pray. Not depend on the prayer of pastor or the elders in this church or the prayer time when we come together, but you must pray. You must pray. You must study your Bible. Read the Word of God. This is basic training. This is the work that must be done so that we're ready to fight the devil. You must be fasting. Jesus said, when you fast, do it like this. He did not say, if you ever decide to fast. We're supposed to fast as part of our spiritual disciplines. Let me tell you something else. You must be baptized in water, not for your salvation, but as an act of obedience to Christ. And if you haven't been baptized in water, you need to be. I know how the baptistry works now. I know how long it takes to fill it up and to heat it up. If you haven't been dipped, let me dip you. Uh, Let's get baptized. It's necessary, part of your spiritual discipline. Even more important than that, you must be filled. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. Not just the initial deposit that comes when you're saved, but the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit of the living God. I'm telling you why, Pastor. Because I look around us and I see sickness. I see worry. I see people with problems they can't solve. That's lion tracks, L-I-O-N. That's the devil's footprints. I look around and I see our kids, your kids, struggling with things and out in the world and not in church. I see spouses that are not serving God. I see people with financial problems and financial difficulties. I see the enemy attacking in our jobs. I can look around the church and see empty nursery and see an empty Children's church room 
and see empty Sunday school rooms and see an empty youth group. The enemy's tracks. The enemy's tracks. Folks, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I look around our community and I see drugs and alcohol and depression and broken homes and pornography and, and, and alternative lifestyles, lesbianism and, and homosexuality and all that stuff that's being called the norm uh, and it's out there and being pumped down our throats. Can you not see the tracks of an, of an enemy that is looking to devour and to destroy? So, well, if I can't get to those adults at Eastgate, let me just lop off the children, and the kids, because eventually they'll all get old and they'll all go on to their reward and then there won't be that Pentecostal church if I can just cut off the next generation. Huh? I'm not trying to speak negative. I'm just trying to say, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Open the eyes of our spirit and let us see at the time of just coming together and playing games and, and, and going through the motions of a worship service. We've got to pray. We've got to read our Bible. We've got to fast. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. We've got to attend every gathering of the church that we possibly can. Why? To be encouraged and to encourage one another. To receive prayer and to pray for one another. To teach and to be taught. It is so important for communal the communal aspects of Christianity. Secondly, we've got to live a holy life. You've got to live your faith when you walk out of this room. You've got to live your Christianity when you go out there to the bank, to the work, to, to be with other family who don't go to church. Oh, that's my greatest regret, I believe, so far in my life is I did not live my Christianity as a high school student. I didn't live it. I don't want that to be said of me ever again. I have repented. I believe the Lord has forgiven me of those things, but it is still in the back of my mind that I failed to share the gospel with people who were hungry and needy and looking for something, and they thought the answer was in suicide. Folks, when we walk out there, how do we combat the enemy? We live Jesus Christ in their sight, in, their, in, in our jobs, in our families, in our communities. We live the truth of what we're saying. And we don't compromise with sin in any area of our lives. God didn't call you to compromise with sin so you could reach a sinner. No. I'm going to drink so that I can reach the drinkers. I'm going to smoke so I can reach the smokers. No, come on. When Paul says, be all things to all men, that's not what he had in mind. Folks, we've got to let Jesus shine. That's how we fight the enemy. And then thirdly and lastly, we've got to take action. In other words, when you see a need, if all you can do is pray about that need, then do it. Pray. Pray. Don't just say, Here's one of my favorites. Had a lady approach me at church, not in Ohio, by the way. This has been years ago. Every Sunday, she said, I park and I walk into church. And as I'm walking in, I'm looking in the bushes and I'm seeing cigarette butts and gum and trash. And it just makes me so mad. And I come in here, and it takes me three or four songs just to get over being mad about the cigarette butts and the gum and the trash. Pastor, something's got to be done about this. Would you get up there in the pulpit, and would you say, don't be throwing your trash in the bushes? And I thought, you know, what a shame. What a shame. So, I didn't say anything from the pulpit. She went to her favorite uh, person on the board who came to me later in the day about, what are we going to do about this issue? I said, you know what? How about instead of getting mad that somebody is throwing their gum and their cigarette butts, why don't we pick it up when we see it and pray for that person and then say, thank you, Lord, that somebody was here on the grounds in their way in to deposit this garbage here. Well, oh, I know, that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear me gripe and complain and get mad just like you are. 
But I'm trying to tell you, let's flip that script. Let's not let the devil gain access by being mad that somebody, do you understand what I'm saying? You see that cigarette butt, just go ahead instead of, Pastor, somebody threw a cigarette butt out there. What are you going to do about it? I'm telling you, this is my church, and we don't allow no smoking in here, and we need to put up signs on the parking lot, and somebody needs to be watching. And Arr. I'm telling you, that's just how twisted up in her thinking she was about it. How about instead we go ahead and pick it up ourselves and we say, Lord, I pray that you would break this addiction of tobacco off of this person. And if they're worshiping here, then let them get filled with the Holy Spirit. If they just threw this out here while they were walking across the parking lot, let the presence of the Holy Spirit be so strong on this parking lot the next time they come walking by here that, that, that the Holy Spirit convicts them and reaches their heart. How about that? Instead, where the devil tried to put something that would cause you to not be able to worship Jesus, why don't you instead take your sword and take your Holy Ghost and do some damage in his kingdom instead. You see that person begging for a handout on the side of the street instead of just getting upset that those grifters are trying to take money from something. Why don't you pray for them? Why don't you honestly lift them up to the Lord? Maybe roll down the window and say to them, I don't have any money to give you, but can I pray for you? Well, I don't want to do that. I just want to gripe and complain about the panhandlers. Yeah, I know. That's been part of our problem is we just want to gripe and complain about all the negative stuff that we see instead of doing what we're supposed to do, Beniah. Hey, Beniah, church, your place in the kingdom is not to gripe and complain and point out all the negativity. Your place in the kingdom is to preach the word, shine the light, Y'all may want to have a meeting after this and vote on pastor. I don't know, but I'm just trying to tell you. It's the truth. Take action. When you see a need, if all you can do is pray about it, then pray about it. But if you can do more than just pray, then do whatever you can do. Don't be afraid to go into the pit. Don't be afraid to go into the pit. Because greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Greater is the Spirit of God living in you than the Spirit that is in this world. And if you will just, that's my prayer, I'm done. My prayer at the end of this, what I have funneled this whole thing towards is this. I want you to wake up and to realize Pastor Conrad isn't coming back through the door. He's not going to take care of it. Pastor Keen isn't coming back through the door. He's not going to do it. The sisters and brothers who used to be here, who've gone on to other places, maybe graduated to heaven, they're not about to walk back through the door and teach the classes and do the things and do the work that they used to do, right? Former pastors, former youth pastors, former staff, they're not coming back in the door to rescue you. It's us. In your family, it's you. At Eastgate, it's us. And so we have to make up our minds when I see a need, the very least that I'm going to do is make that a matter of prayer. And if there's anything further than prayer than I can do, I'm going to step across that line in the sand and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, what can I do about it? How can I make a difference? Seize the day while the day is here to be seized. Don't wait until the night falls and all is lost. Oh, pastor, that's a doom and gloom message. Sometimes we need to be aware that, you know, sometimes somebody had to tell you, you keep spending money like that, you're going to be bankrupt. You keep running up your credit card bills like that, you'll never get out of debt. Somebody has to tell you, you keep, you know, you keep treating your job the way you do and you're not going to have a job anymore. Somebody, maybe it was a mama or a daddy or a grandparent, had to tell you these lessons. Maybe it was a dad who said, you talk to your mama like that one more time. You may be waking up next Tuesday. <laughs> Y'all grew up with nicer parents probably than I did. My mom used to love to say, I'll knock you into next week. <laughs> I've heard a few times I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> but somebody had to have a come to Jesus with you to say, look, you can't keep this up. Eastgate. For most of us, we can't keep at our same level of commitment and see greater things than these happen. 
We've got to look around and see, here's the need, and here I am, and Lord, I'm going to get the spear, and I'm going to get the sword, but you've got to give strength for the battle. Amen? You still love me? I love you. I'm just trying to say, you know, don't wear your rose-colored glasses and think it's all going to be over after a while. It will be, but in the meantime, we've got a wall to build and an enemy to fight off. We've got a church to build and an enemy to fight. And there's not enough for us to delegate only a 5%, 10% fighting force. We've got to all be engaged in the service of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word today. I know it was hard and I know it was challenging. And Lord, I know this morning uh, that it's a wake-up call maybe. It's a challenging word. It's a hard thing. But I pray this morning, Lord, right now that each one who has heard it will receive it and that we, Lord, will just simply look around and say, God, show me the needs and help me to see whatever I can do. If I need to give money, I'll give sacrificially. If I need to give time, I'll see what time that you help me to make available. If I can only give my prayer, then I will be diligent and fervent about doing my part of prayer. Lord, I will fast, I will pray, I will study your word, and I will make myself available. Just keep my eyes open and my spirit willing, I pray, oh God. Show me how I can serve you. Show me how, Lord, you would use me in such a time as this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me for just a brief moment of invitation? I believe we, we, the church in America, has allowed the devil to take too much away from the church. I believe while the church just said it's not our problem, abortion became the law of the land. I believe while the church said it's not our problem, the public display of, of prayer in many places, including our schools and our public buildings, was discouraged and even outlawed. I know a little Christian girl who would take her Bible with her. She was part of our youth group. When she got done with her schoolwork, she would bring her Bible out and begin to read it. Had public school teachers say, you can't do that. She wasn't witnessing. She wasn't teaching a Bible class. She just pulled her Bible out and read it at her desk. The teacher was wrong. She had every right to do that. But nevertheless, she was told by a public school employee, you you put that away, you can't read that. Folks, I'm telling you, while the church has been just simply complaining and griping, wickedness now parades down Main Street and dares us to come against them. What can we do? You better be praying. You better be in your word and you better be filled with God's Holy Spirit. And then as God gives you opportunities, you need to take whatever action the Holy Spirit puts on your mind. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. We're going to win them through love, not through militant action, not through hate, not through standing with signs that say God hates fags. Uh, I see church people doing that. It's the only reason I said that word. You've seen it too. That's not how we're going to win them. We're going to win them by preparing in our prayer rooms, in our war rooms, in our closets, being filled with the Word of God and filled with the Spirit of God so that we can show them the love of God when we get the opportunity. Because they've been lied to by a devil. They've been lied to by a world. But Christ's love breaks every yoke of bondage. Heavenly Father, as I pray over my congregation, your congregation, your children this morning, Lord, if I have said anything that is out of the way or anything that is untoward of a Pentecostal preacher, then I ask your forgiveness and I ask their forgiveness. But Lord, take the meat of this message, a wake-up call for the church to be militant, to be active in our faith, to be fighting against the devil, not people, to be warring against the spirit, not against people, to do our part, to fight against the darkness by shining the light in dark places. Lord, I pray that you would fill each one that is seeking, Lord, that they would be filled with your Holy Spirit. I pray this morning that you would give courage to those who lack courage, that you would give mercy and compassion to those who are in need of it, that you would give spiritual wisdom and direction to those that are searching for you, and that your Holy Spirit would speak very clearly to give us direction in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 
Father, as we move to a, a time of